Let's give it up one more time for Glenn Hoover. Whew, it's so good, so good. It's got me all up in my feelings for sure. That song, all the feels, feeling all the feels right now. Which I gotta say, like, honestly, like when I'm coming into sacred space, like when I'm coming to church, like when I'm be taken to church, that's what I want. Like that's kind of weirdly what I'm yearning for anyways all the time. Like I think I'm like yearning to feel moved or I'm yearning to come into a space where like I can bring this whole mess <laughs> that is like our life and my life and <laughs> the mess of the world and it could be messy and there could be a place like this, that can just like hold it all and have a place to land. Not only like have a place for it to land, but for it to be nurtured and held and perhaps not fully like made sense of, but oriented in a way that can bring power and, and beauty and joy into my life. And so thank you so much for, for bringing that um, to us today. You know that this song, I'd be talking about this song for a little bit here in my talk. You know, the song has been covered by so many people over the years that, like, some people don't even realize who the real, like, author and writer of the song is, Leonard Cohen. It's got this, like, crazy ability. I don't know if you all experienced this, that, like, somehow, like, breaks your heart and lifts you up all at the same time, right? Like, when I was, like, getting a little verklempt over there, when I was sitting there in the seat, like, I wasn't feeling pure sadness, but I wasn't, like, feeling pure joy either, you know, like tears of joy and tears of sadness, it like seemed to come from somewhere deeper in me, you know, like this place deeper in me that kind of knows and recognizes how crazy beautiful this thing called life is, how light and dark, how birth and death, how joy and pain, how they're all inextricably connected. And there's, I think, a part of me that recognizes that and that has the ability to see that, to hold that, and to sta like stand in just like awe, just like pure awe of it all. And for whatever reason, like when that's activated in me, and I don't know if it's the same thing for you all, what's happening with you, but I know for me, what happens is like tears come when I experience all the joy and all the beauty and all the pain and all the confusion all at once and just stand in awe of it, right? And that to me, it's interesting, right, because that comes up, but it's all couched in this, like, word and this constant refrain that's coming over and over, hallelujah, right, hallelujah, which we know is like a religious term, comes out of the Jewish tradition. It simply translates, like, halle just simply means, like, to praise, and yah is a reference to, you know, the Jewish God, the term for God, which is Yahweh, right, so, like, hallelujah. In its most simplest terms, just means like praise God, right? Which kind of be, it's an interesting thing that praise God is like the refrain in the midst of all of these, you know, verses that are about heartbreak and exile and confusion and reconciliation. You know, it's about all of these really complex things and somehow hallelujah is the verse, right? But when we like look at it through this new thought lens, and here in New Thought we have this panentheistic view of, of God, which simply just means that like we believe that, that God is a part of everyone and everything, but it's also like greater than the sum of its parts, right? Like I think it's um, Ernest Holmes, I think he he captures it really well. He says there's there's a power in the universe greater than we are, and we can use it, right? We can use it. We are a part of this great power. It is a part of us. And we can use this realization of that to, to use this power for good things in our lives, like to use it to transform pain and challenging things and heartbreak into beauty. We can, we can use that power to recognize that we are deeply connected to this power within us that has this ability to see it all, so to see it all and to stand in awe of it all. You know, that is a tongue twister to say. Don't. 
And that, that, like, this connection to this thing also exists within everybody else. And so, like, when we are experiencing that and we allow ourselves to experience that, we're somehow feeling connected to everyone around us as well, everyone and everything, right, to life itself. So if God is all there is and we are praising God, you know, we're saying hallelujah, we're kind of just praising it all. We're like, God bless it all. You know, I don't under, I can't claim to understand it, but what? I'm, I'm praising it. Right? I'm praising it because I'm just standing in the awe of it. There's so many like writers and musicians and music lovers that have studied this song. And there's this one writer, Kyson uh, Peaks, that I think he talks about his own experience and interpretation of Leonard Cohen's song and was looking at Leonard Cohen's own sort of Jewish background. And this is what he says um, about the song. He says, the song's constant refrain, hallelujah, takes the listener through a journey of pain, joy, suffering, and celebration. This is a journey that all peoples know, but speaks volumes in, into Jewish history in particular. You know, some have gone as far as to say that the song reflects both Cohen's struggle with faith and tests of faith inflicted upon the Jewish people, which anyone who's read the, the, you know, the Jewish text knows how many trials those people went through. Hallelujah, the song teaches us, is a refrain worthy of times of celebration, of mourning, of regret, of catharsis, of reconciliation. Cohen's song tells a story of broken love, true love remembered and mourned, guilt, penance, and finding peace in the vicissitudes of brokenness. Finding peace in the vicissitudes of brokenness. That is pure beauty right there. And I think that's what's coming up when I listen to this song. It's like, it's acknowledging the brokenness that I've felt with heartbreak or regret <laughs> or exile, you know? But somehow, by acknowledging that, like finding peace in it, like finding peace right in the midst of it and then saying what? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless it, right? And I think we do this all the time. Like I kind of say God bless it for, for a, a myriad of things. Like, I say, God, I say God bless, like, you know, when I'm feeling relieved by something, like every single time I take a COVID test and it's only one line shows up instead of two, like, oh, God bless, thank God, you know, but I, I use God bless it when I am feeling super frustrated at stuff too, when I'm, you know, looking out in the world and just like can't understand why someone is doing whatever they're doing that's frustrating me, it's like, God bless it, like, why, or every time I, like, miss a putt on the golf course by, like, one centimeter, and again, like, I'm just horrible at this game that I've spent so much time on, it's so ridiculous, why do I pay so much money to stay frustrated all the time? <laughs> God bless it. <laughs> this is what we're doing, like, we're practicing a, a, a spirituality of balance all this month, right, and so we're kind of being invited into this practice that says, like, listen, we're not trying to say, like, when we say God bless it all, we're not, like, taking this, you know, rose-colored glasses, Pollyanna way of saying things. It's like, it's all good. It's all God. And I know that's something we like to say around here, and ultimately that's true in the ultimate sense, but I'm not asking us to just to, like, like block out the bad and see the good. Like, I'm not asking us to do that. What we're actually asking is, like, the <laughs> exact opposite of that, Right? It's about recognizing and just like holding the space that like just sees the inherent and inextricable connection between joy and pain, between birth and death, between sadness and happiness, and just stands in the beauty of it all, right, without needing to understand it. It reminds me of this quote by Cleo Gibran, that Lebanese-American poet, uh, who says, beauty is eternity gazing at itself in a mirror. Like, when we look out at eternity, it is filled with a lot of beauty and a lot of stuff that we cannot even ever fully try and understand. And somehow, that's beauty, right? And I searched around, too, for what Leonard Cohen had to say about this song. And I love, like, the little thing I found in this, like, Rolling Stone article, what he says, because I think it really helps me, it, it, like, navigate this incredibly difficult world that we are navigating right now. This is what he says. He said, the world is full of conflicts and full of things that cannot be reconciled. 
But there are moments when we can transcend the dualistic system and reconcile and embrace the whole mess. That's what I mean by hallelujah. That regardless of what the impossibility of the situation is, there is a moment when you open your mouth and you throw open your arms and you just embrace the thing and you say, hallelujah, blessed is the name. The only moment that you can live here comfortably in these absolutely irreconcilable conflicts is in this moment when you embrace it all and you say, look, I don't understand a thing at all. Hallelujah. (laughs) That's the only moment that we can live here fully as human beings. I mean, God, that like felt like such a relief when I read that. I was like, ugh, I don't have to understand or make sense of everything that's going out on in the world, (laughs) hallelujah. (laughs) Maybe I don't have to. (laughs) Praise God. (laughs) Uh, So I want to acknowledge Helen Ohm again for that reading. Thank you for that beautiful reading uh, from this book, Bittersweet. Uh, I'm reading this book, Bittersweet, by Susan Cain, who, and the the text of this book uh, is really the inspiration for this entire talk today that's really inspired asking Brian and Glenn to do hallelujah, uh, really inspired this, this whole thing we're talking about today. Um, you know, Susan Cain's work is so dope. Like, she's also the, the, the author that wrote about introverts called Quiet. Is anyone familiar with that work in the introverts in the room? Hey, shout out to all the introverts in the room, by the way. Um, y'all have to navigate in a, in, in a world in which extrovertedness is way overly valued in our society. And that's what her work is about. You know, she takes these things, these aspects of ourselves, these personality traits that often go unnoticed and undervalued, and she brings light to them, you know? And so her first book, Quiet, was a lot about that. She was like, listen, we live in a world where extroverts, they make all the decisions, they're dominating every room that we're in, and often, let's be real, extroverts may not have the greatest wisdom in the room. I mean, they may in some situations But they most likely statistically do not have the greatest wisdom in the room. And so her first book, Quiet, was really drawing attention to that and the fact that, like, we have to embrace the whole of who we are. We have to, in any group, look at the introverts and look at the extroverts, make sure that we are making room and space for everybody in the room because the real wisdom in the room is the wisdom of the collective, is the wisdom of the whole. This is why representation matters. This is why more people have to be at the table that are making decisions. This is... This idea that like the more of us that are, that are here together, the greater off, like the better off we're going to be, right? And so her second book, you know, Bittersweet, is like a, has a similar vein because she observed like how much our society, especially American society, man, we're so hopelessly optimistic and we just have this need to be happy all the time. Like we just overly value in her mind like happiness and energy and excitement and, you know, productivity, right? To a fault. She's like, she was just saying, they're like, this is, this is a neurosis, guys. <laughs> like, we even built it into our constitution, like, pursuit of happiness. Like, we feel like it's the most important thing in the world. And she's like, yeah, sometimes, right? But if that's the only thing that we're ever valuing, we are not allowing room for this other aspect of ourselves, this melancholic aspects of ourselves, this aspect of ourselves that has the ability to hold paradox, to go deep, to cry about things we don't even know that we're crying about, to, to allow the, the, the beautiful mess of the world to exist without needing to make sense of it, this time to rest, this time to not be productive, <laughs> this time to not be happy, right? This time that we can grieve and know that that grieving is okay. And that grieving is actually helps us transition from, from one reality to another. Like, we need this bittersweet, melancholic aspect of ourselves in order to walk through life. So why are we hiding it away? Why are we denying it? It's a superpower, right? And so, you know, <laughs> it really, she really talked about how, you know, she really opens this book with, with talking about music and, and how, you know, it's this beautiful thing to, to value, you know, songs that are more like hallelujah and less like, you know, Pharrell's happy. <laughs> I got to be honest with y'all. I hate that song. <laughs> like, I hate that song. So, like, I love Pharrell. I love Pharrell. Pharrell, I love you, man. I know you're not watching, but if you are, 
You are great. I hate that song. Um, but I think it's probably because, like, I kind of have a melancholic musical taste. Like, I listen to, like, Radiohead and Bon Iver and, you know, Leonard Cohen. I, like, listen to songs that just make me feel stuff, you know? And, like, I'll listen to Uptown Funk every once in a while at the wedding, but that's not what I'm turning to, you know? <laughs> but she talked about this in her book. I love what she talks about sad, about sad music. She said, sad music is much more likely than happy to elicit what neuroscientist Jack Pansep called shivery goose flesh type of skin sensation, otherwise known as chills. We call them God bumps up in here. Um, people whose favorite songs are happy listen to them about 175 times on average, but those who favor bittersweet songs listen to them almost 800 times. <laughs> We're obsessed. And they also said that they report a deeper connection to the music than those whose favorites made them happy. Right? So just a deeper connection. So, dude, I love bittersweet music. You know, I do. And it makes sense uh, when, I, when I think about it in this, this context of bittersweetness. Like, bittersweetness is about embracing a way of life and a way of being that brings balance to our lives and to the world. It, it helps us navigate complexity. It, it, it sees longing as a virtue. Uh, it, it, it allows us to be comfortable with sadness and with heartbreak and with confusion it asks us to, to, to really embrace that inner musician and that inner artist that I know exists in all of us, right? We can't do it like these guys, but there are aspects of ourselves that knows how to take something that is hard and painful and to transform it into something that is beautiful, right? To transform it into something that can be productive in the world, to transform all the, all the stuff that we're seeing out in the world and to, and, and to, to help it motivate us for change, Motivate us to, to, to work for something better in our lifetime, to do whatever we can in this little, little period that we get, to be here on earth together and to do our best. That's what we're trying to do here as a spiritual community together, right? It's about that kind of alchemical process uh, that helps us innovate, that helps creativity in general is rooted in this kind of melancholic, bittersweet state of being, right? And so I think that's what we're being invited into. I love this part of the reading that, that Helen wrote, uh, that Helen read, uh, from the book that Susan Cain wrote, she said, bitter sweetness is an authentic and elevating response to the problem of being alive in a deeply flawed yet stubbornly beautiful world. Deeply flawed yet stubbornly beautiful. That's how it all feels right now, <laughs> you know, that's, that's kind of how it all feels. Like, I think these past couple of years, you know, have shown us this problem of being alive in this deeply flawed yet stubbornly beautiful world in profound ways, hasn't it? Like, dude, we have seen the worst of us in these past couple of years, have we not? We have seen oh, how horrible public health is and how, we, like, how, how bad we are at it in this country. I think we've seen how selfish we can be as a species. I've seen, I think we've seen how divided it so easy is to become. I think we've seen how adolescent <laughs> we can tend to revert to during times of crisis, how we can just become like these selfish people that are only thinking about ourselves. We've been disrupted and isolated in, in so many ways. But God, in the midst of that, like just beauty, like, it's stubbornly beautiful. Like, they're also in the midst of that, like, connection, joy, unexpected healing, deeper commitment to oneself, a deeper understanding of what matters and maybe what doesn't matter as much as we thought it once did. We've seen love. We've seen sacrifice. It's been ugly, but, like, God, it will not stop being beautiful. There will not, those moments of beauty just are relentless as well. Listen, it's, it's complex. It's real. It's bittersweet, right? Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God for that. And, you know, these holidays, you know, as, as we're sort of beginning to, to bring this to a close as we start talking about these holidays, these holidays, I gotta, I gotta be real, they all feel really bittersweet to me as well, right? They're not just one thing. It's not like just National Donut Day that's just like, <laughs> you know, it's not that easy. These, these, these are not, I mean, that, 
God, this town is the best donuts, you guys. I just, I cannot stop eating donuts. What's wrong with me? Um, they're everywhere. I just can't escape them. Um, but, you know, pride and what we're celebrating this whole month and the parade that's happening today, like, I can't tell you how much I love going to Pride Fest, how special it feels, like, as an ally, to even be invited into those kinds of spaces. It, I just feel like it's, an, like, I just feel like this incredible honor, and I cannot get enough of the energy that I feel when I go to Pride experiences and parades and, and festivities. It is one of the, the coolest, most joyous most amazing uh, spaces I've ever inhabited, right? But they're also filled with complexity, right? This, this whole month is also filled with complexity. I want to share with you some words uh, from our spiritual leader from, from the denomination, Edward Villune, who's also part of that community as well. I want to share a portion of what he, what he, what he talked about uh, when he, he sent this out to the entire, you know, all of the communities. He says, it is a profound act of self-love to celebrate the unique ways spirit manifests in us and others. Pride Month is sometimes seen as the, cel- as the time of year when members of the LGBTQIA2 plus communities and their allies don rainbow regalia, participate in parades, and throw parties. Pride Month, however, also offers us an opportunity to educate ourselves about eliminating stigma, prejudice, and violence that afflicts a significant part of our society. More and more people are starting to learn that the celebration that we refer to as Pride, credited as beginning with the Stonewall riots in June 28, 1969, began as early as May in 1959 in Los Angeles and continued with events leading to the Stonewall riots where transgender women of color act, led an act of protest. We stand with the LGBTQIA2 community as its members profess the truth of their humanity, their health, and well-being as important that justice and equity is a right, not a privilege, and that representation and visibility is essential. Discrimination, injustice, and homophobia are just a few of the discords of the LGBTQIA2 plus community and what it has faced in the past and, let's be real, continues to face today. Those early Pride events in the United States began as actions to eradicate some of the discord that the LGBTQIA2 plus community was facing now the world over. Pride symbolizes not only the celebration of each person's right to be who they are and love who they love, but is also a demonstration of radical self-love and love for all. Right? Yes. That's our spiritual leader. I love the vulnerability, and I love the, the, the challenge he brings to all of us, right? It's complex. We're celebrating. But we also are being really sober about why we are celebrating, right? And similarly with Juneteenth, right? Like, I could not be happier that Juneteenth now is the national federal holiday. That is incredible, <laughs> right? This is year two. You know, organizations are giving people the day off from work. We are celebrating black history and fully acknowledging it as American history in this really deep way. And we're taking time to celebrate the true ending of slavery in our country, right? The Juneteenth commemorates that day of June 19th, 1865, when in Galveston, Texas, Two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by Lincoln, the folks down in Galveston, Texas, finally heard about it and were finally emancipated. Two and a half years later. You know, America has been celebrating two, two days of freedom, right? And, and, and now we get to celebrate both. We get to celebrate both Juneteenth and the 4th of July. And so this is bittersweet, too. This is complex, right? Because, God, it feels good to celebrate this. It is important to celebrate these holidays. It's important to take that day off, you know, and to do so. But it also, recognize, it's asking us to celebrate, like, okay, we're celebrating that day that commemorates the end of slavery, but we are also being challenged to realize, recognize, and do everything we can to eradicate the legacy of slavery and the way that it still exists in our country, right? That's happening both at the same time, both this joy of being able to celebrate, but also this 
deep sadness and remorse, but also, I think, you know, being fortified to actually do something in our lifetime about it, right? It's both. It gets to be both. And if we only want one thing one way and not the other, it does, you know, we can't hold it all. We have to be able to hold both and act from both places. And of course, you know, Father's Day, you know, which for some probably is pure joy. For others, maybe is sadness because perhaps you've lost a father recently in your life. Or perhaps your relationship with your dad was incredibly complex, right? I think most deep relationships are. <laughs> most deep relationships we have in our life are rarely simple, are rarely just one thing. And so I recognize that there are a wide array of experiences that come up with this holiday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for that. And so when we view ourselves as a whole, we can, we can, we can hold all of that together. And so I want to share some words uh, from Universalist Unitarian Minister Rod Rogers uh, that I think really capture uh, and do honor to this day. On this Father's Day, we recognize the vast spectrum of experience and the often complicated feelings that surround such a celebration. We honor those fathers and father figures in our lives who have loved, supported, encouraged, and instructed us, and we seek to share those gifts with others. We mourn with those who mourn the loss of a father and fathers who mourn the loss of a child, whether separated by death or estrangement. We support those for whom this day brings pain and sorrow, who suffered abandonment, neglect, or abuse. And we support and celebrate fathers in our midst who gave themselves and given themselves to their children, recognizing all the strength and wisdom and stamina. I'm thinking about the stamina I'm going to have to have pretty soon here. And love (laughs) and time and honest introspection that fatherhood requires. We support those men who choose not to have children, yet who are present in loving and supportive ways to children, youth and adults alike. We seek to honor wherever we find ourselves today across this vast spectrum of experience and to feel the compassion that embraces us within the silent acknowledgement. So, as we go forth and we celebrate these holidays today, I invite us to embrace the wholeness of our experience and the wholeness of any feelings that may arise when we are celebrating any one of these holidays. Embrace the joy and the celebration, but also recognize, listen to, make room for all of the sadness or melancholy or, or complex feelings that may arise as well. Like when we do that, when we like welcome them both in, when we embrace them, we are singing and we are saying hallelujah. When we're not trying to make sense of them, we're not trying to force ourselves into forgiveness, we're not trying to force ourselves into anything. We're just letting that great power wash through us, wash over us. And that's in that gesture, in that moment, we're simply saying, hallelujah. I can't pretend to understand or know, but I'm going to praise it all. Praise God. Thank God for it all. And I think by doing so, y'all, when we do so, we come into a deeper experience of the divine. Be able to see with God's eyes a little bit, able to hear with God's ears, able to feel with God's heart, the heart behind the heart, the ear behind the ear, the eye behind the eye. When we do so, that to me is is as real as it gets, the deepest experience of the divine we can have. Hi, friends. I hope that our message inspired you today. I want to give you an opportunity to pay it forward. We are able to do all that we do here. We're able to get this message to you wherever you are in the world based on contributions. We're a nonprofit. And so I wanted to give you an opportunity to do that, to pay it forward. You can click the link in the description box below or go to our website. No amount is too small or too big. We are so grateful. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Know that you are loved. Have a good week.